It's not my mind, God damn you. It's Mary Lou Mahoney. Hello, huge movie fanatic Nate, coming at you. This time I'm coming at you to review a late 80s, you know, horror slash slasher. I don't know if I'd really call it a slasher movie, a horror movie sequel. The sequel to Prom Night, incidentally, by the name of um, Hello, Mary Lou, Prom Night 2. Um, basically, I've known about this sequel, I mean, pretty much ever since it came out. I recently got, recently found um, a DVD for $3, so never having seen it, See, seen it, seen, seen it, seen it before, or owning it, or anything. I was very, you know, obviously curious to uh, for three bucks. Is definitely interested in picking it up and, and giving it a view. I it seems to me like I don't know if it was the title, but or the poster or something. But I mean, I've always had this maybe just automatic awareness that it was, you know, a very a loose sequel in a sense that it's really not a, necessarily even a sequel. It's kind of just using, you know, just like Prom Night 2, kind of like Halloween 3, which should have probably just been Halloween Season of the Witch. Like, Prom Night 2 really shouldn't have been Prom Night 2. It could have been like Hello Mary Lou Prom Night or Prom Night Hello Mary Lou. I don't know. Or just plain old Hello Mary Lou. But, you know, calling it Prom Night 2 is kind of misleading because it's one of the rare occasions where it's a sequel to a movie and it really has nothing to do or doesn't follow any of the traditions or any of the things that the first one did. That's kind of, it happens every now and then, but it's more, it's kind of a rare uh, occurrence, unless of course it's Halloween 3 or something like that. So, this movie, I mean, it's kind of daring in a way to, to do a sequel. I mean, you know, that's, I mean, let's face it, I mean, the, the Prom Night 2 thing is probably just a way to get, you know, interest in, from people, just automatic interest that might not have already been interested in it. But regardless, for whatever reason, it is called Prom Night 2, and I guess it's kind of, when this happens, when a sequel happens and it's so far detached from the previous entry, it's really rare, or really uh, risky and kind of, you know, uh, what, what's that word? Kind of a, a daunting, or a, well, I don't know what the word is, but we'll just say risky, or I don't know what the word is. We'll just say risky and ambitious, maybe not ambitious, but whatever. It's just kind of a daunting, not so done very often kind of a situation where you have a sequel that's got nothing to do with the original. So this particular movie, it's kind of cool, just like the first movie, probably the only similarity between Prom Night 1 and 2 is the fact that, you know, the second one, just like the first one, has the incident scene. This movie came out, or I want to say, in 1987. The incident scene that, that takes place in the opening of the movie happens 30 years prior, 1957. It's really kind of cool. This this movie, I'd say, you know, the, I will give, you know, some props for just doing, like, having the incident happen, not just simply, you know, like seven years prior, but a whole 30 years prior. And, you know, bl blending two different eras, namely 1957 and 1987 in this case, was really kind of a cool thing to do. Obviously, it being probably a more low-budget movie, the uh, <clears throat> I noticed a lot of the hairstyles of the kids in the 1957 footage of the beginning of the movie are very 80s hairstyles, of course, but whatever, you know, they, they the, the, the music and the soundtrack at the beginning of the movie that takes place in 57 is permeated with 50s, kind of classic 50s songs, which was very much appreciated, and basically, uh, you know, this is kind of prom night meets Carrie in a lot of ways, particularly towards the end of the movie, I'll get to that towards the end of the review, but the the, the setup for this movie is, is this promiscuous Mary Lou Mahoney character, is really, the girl who plays her is really pretty attractive in the face, and unfortunately she's, you know, kind of only in the beginning and a little bit of the end, but She's a promiscuous girl from 1957, just, you know, she's at the, the beginning of the movie's prom night in 57, and, you know, she's with this one guy, and then goes off and kind of cheats behind the stage or something with uh, with this other guy, and this guy finds out, and he's pissed off, and he basically takes his kids, a couple of these pranks or stink bombs, and he's going to climb up onto the, above the stage where Mary Lou's going to get, the, you know, queen to the, or queen the prom, queen, if that's how you say it or whatever, get the get the crown, I'll crown the prom queen. So this guy goes above on the rafters or whatever, above the stage where she's going to receive the crown for prom queen, and he throws, lights the stink bomb and throws it down, and it lands right at her feet and lights her, you know, dress on fire, and basically in a kind of a Carrie-ish uh, scene or whatever, it, you know, Mary Lou Mahoney just burns alive, basically burns to death you know, writhing and in, in pain and just whatever and 
burning up. Everyone looks on in horror, and the guy who, uh, you know, she was cheating on, I, it looks like he's like half trying to save her and half, you know, too afraid to go near her, try to, you know, take his coat and put the fire out. I don't really know what's going on. If, if, if he was, you know, supposed to be, his intention was to save her, and then he chickened out or whatever. But that's the event scene of, uh, you know, Hello, Mary Lou, Prom Night 2 at the beginning, the kind of the thing that triggers the rest of the movie, of course. And I think we pretty much cut uh, 30 years later now to the same high school. It's around, you know, prom night, or pro, it's around prom time now 30 years later. And, and actually uh, the principal, we find out, Michael Ironside is, is one of the key players of this movie. Michael Ironside plays the principal, who incidentally was also the guy who accidentally set her on fire. Um, so this guy's son is one of the, you know, high school kids and, and then, you know, this guy's son is going out with this blonde, which is kind of the lead girl. For all intents and purposes, she's more or less kind of the main character we follow. And we briefly introduce, you know, 1987 high school era. And like I say, even though maybe they didn't pull off 50s perfectly, like it's just kind of cool in this movie to you know, have 30 years of difference between, you know, they kind of see a 1950s prom night and then an 80s, you know, an 80s prom night, which is kind of cool. So now introducing the characters, the contemporary characters, we kind of get to know them a little bit. One of my problems with this movie is, is I, it's a little bit, I mean, I don't know, I guess some of the characters in particular, maybe that nerd guy who does the, has that computer room at the high school, whatever, he's probably one of the more interesting characters and but like, I don't know, the, I'd say like, he's probably the most interesting character and for, for, for the most part none of the other characters really do anything for me. They're kind of just going through their, kind of going through the motions and stuff. But uh, what ends up happening is is uh, this blonde chick, the kind of lead girl, her parents, or her mom's a bitch, you know, religious fanatic, and her I mean, dad's, and this dad, her dad's nicer, but she wants a new dress for prom, but, you know, they won't. Uh, you know, buy her one, so she's basically in the high school, goes down to this, uh, what, whatever it's called, prop room for plays or whatever, and goes through the clothes and tries to find a, you know, basically steal or, you know, or, and or borrow a, a prop dress from the high school to, to use for a new dress to go to prom, and she ends up finding this trunk, which basically, I guess, I don't know, Michael Ironside, having been the guy who accidentally killed her, I don't know if he, you know, now being the principal sometime in the past, he must have boxed up a lot of her belongings from that night or something and put them in this trunk and put them in the basement of this high school. This, uh, the lead blonde girl ends up prying open the trunk, which kind of, you know, this is pre-Puppet Master by a couple of years, so, uh, although Puppet Master is not exactly a haunting kind of a ghost, ghost movie, but same kind of trunk, and this girl ends up prying open the trunk, releasing Mary Lou's Mahoney's freaking evil, um, it's always funny how like evil can you know can't is is in a movie like this is contained in a in a you know piece of crap trunk you know it can't just go through the trunk or whatever but it's just like you know it's a horror movie from the 80s so as so many times with so many other horror movies you go with it uh, so she opens the trunk unknowingly releasing the you know Mary Lou's freaking whatever just wrath upon the high school and and stuff so this is. It's kind of, like I said, it's kind of an interesting take to a sequel to Prom Night because it just does a completely different thing where it's more like, you know, towards the beginning of the, well, the majority of the movie, the the stuff that Mary Lou, I mean, it's not like Mary Lou in physical form, it's more like a haunting. I think one of the first kills is this girl who's a high school student who's accidentally pregnant, who's, you know, is actually Mary Lou actually makes her, you know, basically look like she killed herself in a really cool scene where this, she's, she's trying on her cape or something and the cape kind of goes around her neck and pulls her over the light fixtures and actually going to pull her through this paper cutter and at first I was like, oh, that's cool, they're going to cut her head off, that didn't happen, and pulls her over the fit light fixtures and strangles her only to like throw her out the window and so it basically makes it look like a suicide. So it's kind of like a, you know, a ghost you know, poltergeist haunting kind of a, you know, thing, or evil dead thing or something, just where you don't see anything, it's just this, you know, the the spirit or whatever, evil presence of Mary Lou is, is making this stuff happen, so. Oh yeah, the, the blonde chick found uh, Mary Lou's crown from the trunk in addition to other things, maybe this uh, cape and stuff, and what, what really, tra what, what made Mary Lou kill this girl was basically she, had, for, what re for whatever reason, she was fiddling around, this pregnant girl was fiddling around with the crown and, you know, popped a ruby or whatever off it, and then it just pissed off Mary Lou's ghost, and she basically suicided her, so that's, 
So don't don't mess with crowns because it could you could be suicided. So like so many horror movies, uh, this one's got a really tiresome ongoing kind of not a big it's not about religion, but there's this tiresome you know religious freaking priest presence in this movie and you know being non-religious or if I may say so anti-religious actually. Uh, that kind of stuff in movies just really just bugs me and you rolls my makes my <laughs> makes me roll my eyes and just like uh, but whatever in, in a way this movie has more of a reason for this because what ends up what we end up finding out is the guy who Mary Lou was cheating uh, you know cheating with in 1957 ends up being a priest so he's kind of a priest character in this movie and we see ongoing priest crap with this guy and you know, I think at some point in the movie, you know, Michael Ironside, who's the guy who accidentally killed her, and the guy, you know, this priest guy end up getting together and talking about stuff like, oh, you know, with the haunting, or could it be happening, or whatever, but that's a character that, of course, you know, at some point he gets wind of what's happening, and Mary Lou's come back, you know, somehow, or whatever, and he's telling the Ironside character, oh, you gotta repent, and only this can save you, and holding a cross, you know, a freaking crucifix thing, and it's just like, uh... But whatever. I mean, I guess you know. I don't know. It's if it, it seems like every freaking I don't know five minutes or so. It's it's always this damn you know shot of the church and uh, and inside with this guy and it's just like uh, whatever. So throughout the course of the movie, maybe a halfway point or a little bit before the, or towards the end of the one third mark of this movie, the blonde ends up you know more and more stuff happens, and the blonde ends up seeing a couple of just strange haunting scenes where I don't know she sees this scene of a kind of a you know like Nightmare on Elm Street four at the diner when the Alice sees herself older or whatever she just sees like the people at the school serving lunch just all decrepit and ghost-like and zombie-ish and she sees all, a couple times in this movie very briefly there's all these scenes with this main character blonde girl is seeing all these hauntings and scary images with her rocking horse in her room and they made, made a big trouble to make this freaking like animatronic a little bit of this rocking horse comes kind of possessed and evil and a, a big tongue comes out and it's kind of face moves and a little bit of probably like, I don't know, animatronics or just, you know, wire control, cable control movements on this horse. They end up showing it later on in the movie. They're like, I was watching it. I was like, well, you made the damn thing. Might as well show it again. <laughs> yeah, went through the trouble to make it. So uh, th th those are the kind of things, you know, I'm more of a... Uh, a fan of just like a stock and slash where you just have a, a human killer or an undead Jason character or something like that. I'm not really the biggest fan of paranormal uh, kind of goings on because there's really no, I mean, there's really no, um, I guess that's a good thing not having any, uh, what, what am I trying to say, there's no limits or boundaries of what can happen which I guess can make the imagination run wild and come up with really cool things. But I'm just more of a physical killer kind of a guy in my movies, so, you know, I wasn't really crazily digging all this just, I don't know, you know, poltergeist kills and just strange haunting scenes and all that kind of stuff. I'm really not that abstract-minded kind of an individual, but I'm, I'm sure this movie has, you know, a lot of fans that do enjoy that stuff. It's almost like kind of this movie probably maybe took a little bit of inspiration from maybe some of the... Nightmare on Elm Street sequels, you know, maybe three or three had come out or whatever before that time. I don't think four had even come out yet, but it just seems to me like it may have been, you know, influenced by Elm Street 3 or something like that, whatever. I guess it could be doing its own thing too, what do I know? So some point, maybe towards the halfway mark or point of this movie or the hour mark or something, it's kind of a cool scene where the blondes in the, you know, most of the movie takes place in the high school, this blonde's in the classroom. I think at some point, I don't know if this is when she's in, you know, in detention or whatever for slapping some girl. This might be when she's in detention at some point in a relatively cool scene, which again is something that kind of feels like it could have been in a, you know, late 80s Nightmare on Elm Street sequel. This girl, the blonde main girl, kind of gets sucked into the chalkboard and they kind of do this, you know, probably a water, like a, you know, a pool, a water effect, you know, and shoot it in a way it looks like it's on the wall. Really kind of cool and some of the letters on the, on the chalkboard get swimming, you know, or like, as it's like a kind of a little bit of a whirlpool and she's getting pulled into this water, waterish looking chalkboard, some of the letters on the chalkboard or swimming around in circles and stuff and that's kind of a cool gimmick and, you know, I will give the movie props for the, creative kind of haunting stuff going on but what's happening with her getting what turns out happening with her getting sucked into the chalkboard is that she kind of becomes at that point possessed by uh, for all intents purposes by Mary Lou 
at that point and I think that's like at the hour mark or something like that or you know hour five hour ten minutes or something like that where this blonde chick ends up getting uh, possessed by Mary Lou and of course it's really kind of cool because after that for a while she's wearing 1950s you know you know high school student clothes and you know that's really kind of cool where she's dressing 50s because she's basically Mary Lou's you know uh, mentality or mind or whatever spirit in her body so that's really cool where she's you know um, dressing in the 50s high school uh, look and at one point of course and, as, and we've seen this in horror movies before and since and stuff where now that she's possessed she's kind of given her boyfriend a little more than maybe she gave uh, you know or we'll just say the boyfriend's getting a little more than maybe he's ever gotten before we'll just say that and very interestingly enough there was this uh, you know it looked like we were never going to see this blonde chick naked or topless I was kind of like just being the old kind of pig I am, I was watching this movie and seeing some lumps, you know, on her chest and when she's at the beginning and the, you know, she's looking in the mirror, I'm like, oh, it'd be cool to see those lumps. I didn't say that out loud or even think the word lumps until just now. But uh, as the movie wore on, I'm like, well, they're probably not going to show this chick, you know, topless or anything because she's kind of the good girl and lead girl and stuff. And generally lead girls don't get, you know, topless and stuff. But it's in this really cool kind of a twist where this, you know, this girl is, you know, possessed, uh, you know, this blonde possessed by Mary Lou and I can't I don't remember she's with this other girl in the in the locker room in the shower and stuff and there's some kind of quarrel and then the girl goes in the shower and she comes in so it's like full nudity this blonde girl does like full nudity I mean full frontal you know rear I mean every see pretty much everything and she walks into the into the shower with this girl and kind of looks like she's gonna start making out which just scares her even more and the, the girl is kind of a cat and mouse thing and this girl ends up run, in, ends up getting into a locker in the locker room girls locker room and she does this really this is probably one of the coolest things in the movie uh, Mary Lou just like looks right at camera and says something like wop bop beat up but up bang boom or like when she says boom there's a shot of the lockers going Kirk! and like crushing where the girl's hiding and it's like and the blood comes out of the center there where the girl's hiding and it's, it's probably a miniature little thing but it really worked well and I was just like yeah that's probably the, the best part of the whole movie for me and having the character you know the possessed Mary or the blonde possessed by Mary Lou say that kind of 50s song and you know wop bum boom and like right when she says that it crushes her that was like completely unexpected I was just like holy shit that was cool you know this this movie does kind of you know trudge on and is a little bit slow and doesn't have terribly that many interesting characters but I will say some of the things really took me by surprise like when that chick just got you know basically killed by the possessed you know cape and all this kind of stuff I really wish she would have been had her head cut off by that paper cutter because I don't think I've ever seen that in a horror movie before um, but uh, there were some instances that one in particular is just like wow that was unexpected um, so I will give the movie, you know, the filmmaker props for, for that. That was, like, really cool. It's funny, there's this bitch kind of, you know, prissy character who wants to, you know, she, she wants to rig the, herself with the nerd computer guy who's in control of the votes for prom queen. She wants to rig, you know, bribe this guy with, you know, a $20 bill or, you know, 50 or whatever, some money or something to get this guy to, uh, to, to make her, regardless of the vote, to make her the prom queen. And at one point, I think she ends up, I think we're meant to believe she ends up giving him a BJ to, uh, to get, you know, this guy's like, you know my price, and she, I think she ends up giving him a BJ, which really isn't hinted at very much in, in, in rated R horror movies and stuff. So that's kind of fun that they had that little plot point in this movie. So this character, in this funny side note, gives this guy a BJ, you know, to have this guy. He shouldn't do something first and then expect something because, you know, you never know if he's going to do what he said, hold up his end of the bargain, if you know what I mean. But, uh, this is kind of cool because what ends up happening, of course, is I think his intention was to, you know, obviously she did him a favor. So I think his intention was to, you know, to rig it to make her win. But what ends up happening is Mary Lou zaps this guy in a kind of a cool death through his computer screen and really kind of cool, you know, zap lightning effects. He's like, uh, just sitting in front of his, like, it's an old freaking Apple, you know, one of those Apple computers with the small screen with the disk drive right under the in the screen itself right underneath it and stuff and in the cool scene where he gets zapped electrocuted a lot you know to death with uh, the Apple computer and 
Then, of course, Mary Lou rigs her, her own winning herself just by being in control of the computer or whatever. And it was funny to see when they called, you know, the prom queen is, you know, and of course, the name of this blonde girl is Vicky. It's not like they say Mary Lou. Uh, they say Vicky, which, of course, is possessed by Mary Lou. And it was funny to see this bitch's expression that gave the other guy a BJ, you know, like, <laughs> to, to be, you know, to be to have that guy make her prom queen. This is fun to see her reaction as, as the Vicky character, the blonde, possessed by Mary Lou, goes up on stage. And what ends up happening is throughout the course of the movie, Michael Ironside, who of course is the principal, the guy who accidentally burned her at the beginning of the movie, is throughout the course of the movie, uh, she actually kills the priest guy for, you know, that, that uh, she cheated with. And Michael Ironside, you know, the priest guy and Ironside are I think throughout the course of the movie realizing what's going on and, you know, walking up the same kind of ladder and same bit 30 years, you know, the same scaffolding 30 years later that he did, uh, you know, 30 years earlier to, he t he's taken a gun, he plans to go up and shoot because he knows that this blonde is possessed by Mary Lou, so his plan, I guess, is to go up and, you know, scaffolding or whatever and shoot her, so as soon as she's like, this poor girl can never be, you know, Mary Lou just wants to be crowned prom queen and it's like the second time she's going to actually be crowned it's like he shoots her and he ends up or she ends up you know Vicky the blonde ends up you know dropping dead on stage and then like a zombie version of you know the girl who actually played Mary Lou at the beginning of the movie comes out of you know, the blonde's freaking body and it's like Bleh. and it's this complete and total ripoff of Carrie and Sue's at this point where it's just like she's all zombie dead looking and she's just making all this stuff happen where pe fires and explosions and stuff where basically people are dying and as this little bit of a scene progresses you become more and more aware of the fact that it seems to be like, you know, the more people die the more she, you know, probably gives her, you know, brings her more back to her from, from a rotted undead corpse more to her normal pretty you know, teen high school self, so more people, you know, die and we'll cut back to her and she's less gross and more people die and she's getting even cuter and to the end of the scene where she's got, she's mostly cute and hot and stuff with maybe a little bit of kind of just dead flesh on her or something, which is a kind of a cool gimmick. So, you know, she basically kills in a very carry ripoff, you know, all these, you know, prom going patrons and stuff to get revitalized as her normal self and like I say this girl's really like got a hot attractive face so it's kind of a bummer that just like the movie Jason goes to hell she's only in the beginning and uh, a little bit of the end you know it's just like she's but whatever that's the way the movie was written I guess but uh, so I actually don't remember what the hell happened like after that I know that uh, the boyfriend of the uh, the blonde girl and at that point you think the blonde girl is dead but no in a kind of lame you know happy end or whatever the boyfriend ends up going down to the trunk and pulls basically in a completely nonsensical of course the whole movie kind of is a nonsensical ending pulls the physical embodiment and you know completely unharmed you know blonde unpossessed blonde character um, I think the character's name is Vicky out of the trunk and she's all slimy for you know no good reason or whatever and she's all naked for you know good reason I mean naked's always good or whatever I, I should take that I'll take that back that just sounded gross out it sounded better in my head <laughs> but uh, moving on uh, boyfriend pulls, you know, so all, all's well in, in the high school or whatever on prom night because the girl, it kind of would have been cool and more, I don't know, uh, a little bit of sad or dramatic that, the, that, you know, the blonde would have in fact died, which is of course what any viewer assumed when the corpse or the, the, you know, the Mary Lou zombie came out of her body, but I guess you got to make a happy ending and then like, I don't know, the, the boyfriend and the blonde all, you know, get all in the car with dad, who was, you know, the guy who thought he killed, uh, I, I don't remember what happened with the zombie, you know, the, the revitalized Mary Lou, but it must have not have been enough to remember. But the very end of the movie is, is oh yeah, him, Mary Lou and, the, you know, Ironside have some kind of, you know, they get together and some kind of conflict or some kind of something, and, and then we're just kind of ambiguous, and then you know, Ironside, who's the father of the, you know, boyfriend of the blonde, and, and, and you know, the blonde and his son get in the car, and he kind of turns around and says something like, so basically it's dad, you know, Ironside is now possessed with uh, Mary Lou's uh, spirit or whatever, and it's just like, hey, 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 glowing eyes, and he turns around and just speeds off in the car, and the kids are like, ah, so it's funny how they, you know, they have the 
you know, you think the blonde's gonna die, and then she doesn't. Oh, happy ending, only to have like a, you know, one of those endings that's just like kind of the ending that Elm Street, the first movie, where it's just like you think everything's fine, and then it's just not. And so maybe the maybe the writer slash, you know, filmmakers of this movie got inspiration from just some of the nightmare movies. It it, it does seem like that very much so. So that is Hello Mary Lou Prom Night Two. So um, I did find, although the movie does have some really cool you know, bits and is relatively, you know, kind of different than a normal sequel to a slasher movie and, and has some relatively good gags and good ideas and stuff. I found the movie on the whole, unfortunately, to be kind of, I don't know, just like a snail's pace and a lot of, the majority of the characters weren't in particularly interesting and most of the movie seemed more or less kind of directionless, so I'm only going to be able to go one and three quarter stars out of four stars for Hello Mary Lou of Prom Night 2. I don't regret buying it. it you know, the DVD actually looks really great, upscaled on HGTV. Um, it's cool to have, you know, on, in the collection. I'll, you know, I won't put it in the, you know, get rid of pile. Um, it, like I say, it's just one of those rare occasions where the sequel really has nothing to do with, uh, the, the original, the, the original, the movie that preceded it, but um, it's kind of, um, as I was trying to find the word for it at the beginning, I, can't, I still can't find the word for it, just daunting or whatever kind of a thing, when in fact it's probably just basically making a movie and then at the last minute they're probably like, oh, well, we'll just, uh, and maybe it was called Hello Mary Lou and maybe at the last minute they got the rights to Prom Night and they just were going to call it Prom Night too. Um, so be warned, I mean, it, it's not like, you know, any characters or anything that happened, you know, any kind of con continuation of the original Prom Night, which is kind of okay because, I mean, oh, I, I forgot to mention that I have already reviewed uh, Prom Night on this channel years and years ago along with, uh, you know, a Blu-ray, a recent Blu-ray release of it at the time. So if you, if you haven't seen my review of Pr uh, Prom Night, feel free to check that out as well. Yeah, neither of these movies did a whole hell of a lot for me. It's funny because, you know, because the first one's more slash and stock, it's kind of more of my forte, but that's lame for its own reasons too. These are probably kind of like, I don't remember the star rating I gave the first one, but they're kind of like probably, you know, I kind of think of them probably equally, like they each have their okay points and not okay points, and I guess I'm rambling on. So thank you very much for watching this review, and as always, We'll catch you next time.